Hello, welcome to BEH 107, Mental Health Disorders. Today we're going to be discussing schizophrenia. The slide or the picture that I have on this uh, screenshot is a healthy brain versus a schizophrenic brain and you will notice that there are significant differences in terms of the white matter that you would see in a brain. So let's talk about schizophrenia and what it is. It is characterized by delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech and behavior, and other symptoms that cause social or occupational dysfunction. From a historical perspective, it's been described in documents for thousands of years. But the condition was not named until 1887 by Dr. Emil Krepelin, who originally called it Dementia Praecox, or Early Dementia. The Swiss psychiatrist Eugene Bleuler coined the term schizophrenia in 1911 after it was determined that the condition was not related to dementia. In a sense, what schizophrenia means is your brain is split. does not mean that you have a split personality, but your brain, in a sense, is broken. If you imagine taking a hammer to a mirror and cracking the mirror, that's almost imagining what your brain does. It doesn't perceive reality in the same way that someone who doesn't have schizophrenia does. So it's about how we perceive the reality that we see, hear, and experience. So who gets schizophrenia? Approximately 1% of the population develops schizophrenia during their lifetime. More than 2 million Americans suffer from the illness in any given year. Schizophrenia affects slightly more men than women and the disorder appears earlier in men, usually in their late teens or early 20s, whereas in women the onset occurs in their 20s to early 30s. It's very hard to diagnose teenagers because a lot of the initial symptoms can oftentimes be tied to teenagers being teenagers. So they include things like change of friends, drops in grades, sleep problems, irritability, and all of these behaviors are pretty common among teenagers. Also, other factors that clinicians will look at include isolating oneself from others, an increase in unusual thoughts and suspicions, and most importantly, a family history of psychosis. So again, what you see here on the right-hand side in the picture is a schizophrenic brain versus a normal adolescent brain. And the red is the electrical impulses where you see their reality or what they're seeing, their sensory experiences are much different than a normal brain. So if you see a pretty girl walking down the street and your brain is telling you it's a pretty girl, somebody with schizophrenia might instead see a dragon or a snake instead. So their perspective, their reality is based on hallucinations and delusions. For a diagnosis, at least two symptoms must be present for six months and include at least one month of active symptoms. At least one symptom should include either one, two, or three, also known as positive symptoms, which are psychotic behaviors not generally seen in healthy people. Positive symptoms indicate a person has lost touch with some aspect of reality and those include delusions, hallucinations, and disorganized speech. I have an example of disorganized speech later in this PowerPoint. Other symptoms include grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, and negative symptoms such as affective flattening or a restricted range of emotions, 
and avolition, which is a lack of motivation. And this is sometimes um, manifested by somebody who will literally just sit or stand and look out the window for hours with no intent to do anything beyond that. There are also cognitive symptoms that include poor executive functioning, which is the ability to understand information and use it to make decisions, trouble focusing or paying attention, and problems with working memory, i.e. the ability to use information immediately after learning it. So what you see here in the chart that I have on this slide is that 85% of patients with schizophrenia show cognitive impairment. They don't make good decisions and they can't really use information very effectively because their reality is so much different than a normal person's reality. Within criterion B symptoms, you look for social or occupational dysfunction, including a significant portion of the time since the onset of the disturbance, one or more major areas of functioning are markedly below the level achieved prior to the onset, such as work, interpersonal relations, or self-care. When the onset is in childhood or adolescence, Failure to achieve expected level of interpersonal, academic, or occupational achievement is a key indicator. So, you know, if somebody is not achieving levels that you would expect them to achieve in high school, for example, because they claim that there are voices telling them the wrong answers, or that hallucinations are getting in the way of their ability to study. These are indicators that there's a big problem. Then there are subcategories of schizophrenia. We have paranoid schizophrenia, which is characterized by auditory hallucinations, delusions of being persecuted by others, meaning they believe the CIA is out to get them, the NSA, they might believe the aliens are tracking them, or the Russians, or um, a particular um, government agency is tapping their phones, anything like that. Delusions of grandeur, um, and you oftentimes hear people say that the president is their real father, or the king of England is their real father, or um, Angelina Jolie is their real mom. And these are situations where it's clear that the person is delusional, but they have these grand visions of who they really are. Another aspect to this paranoid schizophrenia with delusions of grandeur is that they are the true son of God or the true son or daughter of Satan. And these are very popular in terms of schizophrenia. This grandeur, the highest level of grandeur you can achieve is being the son or daughter of God. The picture on the right is of Princeton professor John Nash, who was the subject of the movie A Beautiful Mind, starring Russell Crowe, and it detailed his struggle with paranoid schizophrenia. This guy was one of the most brilliant mathematicians. He literally invented the concept of game theory, and he won a Nobel Prize for it. He struggled his entire life with paranoid schizophrenia. Um, he was recently died in a car accident a couple years ago in New Jersey and his son who also has a PhD in mathematics also suffers from paranoid schizophrenia and we're going to talk about the genetic connection in a few minutes. Then we have disorganized schizophrenia which is marked by bizarre ideas often about one's body, such as having the belief that your bones are melting, confused speech, and the example here, this young man on the right says, I can't find the pickles, I need a knife to write my paper. They're using words that are actual words, but the order they're putting them in makes no sense. 
Um, and that's what we mean by disorganized or confused speech. Childish behavior, great emotional swings. They might be laughing one minute, sobbing the next. And often extreme neglect of personal hygiene and their appearance. So, you know, oftentimes you might pass somebody on the street who's homeless and they are, uh, haven't looked, they look like they haven't taken a shower in months. Um, they are caked in their own filth. They're wearing clothes that are literally rags. They may have lice or any other kind of bugs, you know, crawling on them. And they have no problem with this because, you know, with schizophrenia, how one appears to the outside is irrelevant because it's about their own reality. And then we have catatonic schizophrenia which is characterized by periods of wild excitement or periods of rigid prolonged immobility and sometimes the person assumes the same frozen posture for hours on end and at times that posture can be extremely uncomfortable but it's like they divorce themselves from the physical body and it is like Plato they just are put into a position and their brains go away for a while so it's a very odd thing and then once they come out of the position they can you know push themselves into a wall or throw themselves into um, you know a frenzy and it becomes something that's quite dangerous for them so let's talk about what causes schizophrenia and we're going to talk about genes first because the illness occurs in less than 1% of the general population but it occurs in 10% of people who have a first degree relative with the disorder such as a parent a brother or a sister the risk is highest for an identical twin of a person with schizophrenia he or she has a 40 to 65 percent chance of developing the disorder scientists believe that many different genes contribute to an increased risk of schizophrenia but that no single gene causes the disorder by itself recent research has found that people with schizophrenia tend to have the highest rates of rare genetic mutations so when we are looking at you know any kind of genetic anomaly it's never just one genetic anomaly it is usually a cluster of genetic anomalies that lead to a particular condition. Then we have the environment. And scientists often um, are now thinking that interactions between genes and aspects of the individual's environments are necessary for schizophrenia as well as many other diseases or conditions to develop. It's like having a light switch. You need a certain condition for the light switch to come on. So if a human or puppy comes into a room and manages to get the light switch on, that's the environmental um, activator. So some of the environmental activators that may be involved in schizophrenia include exposure to viruses or malnutrition before birth. So if mom who's pregnant um, gets a cold or a uh, viral infection while she's pregnant, um, through no fault of her own uh, that could ultimately result in the um, onset of schizophrenia when the child grows up additionally malnutrition if the mother who is pregnant is not getting proper nutrition um, that could be the environmental factor problems during birth and then you have psychosocial factors environmental psychosocial factors such as hostile parents, poor socialization, lack of social support during stressful periods, and the death of a sibling or parent. There is a theory called the diathesis stress theory, and some people have a genetic predisposition, otherwise known as a diathesis, that interacts with life stressors to result in the onset and development of schizophrenia. So, you know, mom and dad do everything right. They're great parents. They are, you know, supportive and loving and, 
you know, mom was not sick, everything went really well, and then when a kid is a teenager and suddenly the radio starts talking to him and telling him that he is the son of God or Satan wants him to kill, what that means is there are stressors in his life. You know, for example, where uh, what college is he going to go to? Is he studying for the SATs? The normal stressors in life that could then turn on the genetic predisposition and develop the onset of schizophrenia. Then there is the adolescence and marijuana correlation. Multiple research studies show an association between smoking a lot of marijuana and developing psychosis or schizophrenia later on. This is not based on the idea that somebody who is not at risk for schizophrenia would develop it. But if it runs in the family, if there is a genetic predisposition in the family for schizophrenia, it could bring about the onset of the disorder. So again, remember, if there's a first degree relative and there's a 10% chance in the family that's only, you know, 10% is not a huge amount, but if there's a 10% chance and you're smoking a lot of marijuana as a young person, that could be the springboard to schizophrenia beginning. And, you know, that's one of those things that if it is running in your family, you would want to stay away from marijuana, um, especially, you know, through your adolescence and young adulthood. Then there's brain chemistry. Neurotransmitters are substances that brain cells use to communicate with each other. Scientists think that an imbalance in the complex interrelated chemical reactions of the brain involving neurotransmitters, especially dopamine and glutamate, and possibly others, play a role in schizophrenia. Dopamine neurotransmitter system is somehow overactive and gives rise to a wide range of symptoms. Ergo, when the person has hallucinations, they may not see the pretty girl walking towards them, but instead see a dragon or a snake. Then we look at the brain structure. Abnormal brain structures involving ventricles, which are fluid-filled cavities in the center of the brain. In 80% of people with schizophrenia, they are larger than normal. So if you look over on the right hand side, you'll see brain scans. There's a normal brain, lots of white space, very little of those fluid filled ventricles. You look at the schizophrenic brain right in the center, lots of that space that's fluid filled ventricles. So it's a very obvious difference in a normal versus a schizophrenic brain. The brains of people with the illness also tend to have less gray matter and some areas of the brain may have less or more activity. So there's less activity in the prefrontal cortex and what you see here is this red marks. This red is the activity in a normal brain you don't see as much in a schizophrenic brain. The frontal and temporal lobes, the frontal lobe is in the front obviously. Temporal lobes are right above the ears, tend to be smaller in a schizophrenic brain. So, you know, obviously what we're looking at here is not somebody who just went a little crazy. There are significant biological and genetic differences in the brains and the chromosomes and the genetic materials that lead a person to have these hallucinations and these delusions. So are schizophrenics violent? When schizophrenics are in treatment that is un extremely unlikely that they are violent. Even if they are not in treatment they are far more likely to hurt themselves than others and schizophrenics have a very high rate of attempting suicide. Almost 50% of them have tried to commit suicide at one point or another. 
Violence is much more likely when the schizophrenic is not being treated and their psychosis has convinced them that something or someone is out to get them, i.e. when they're paranoid. Self-medicating with street drugs or alcohol can also lead to violent behavior. So you can see, you know, there's a brain anomaly and then let's throw some, you know, whatever they're using, whether it be heroin, cocaine, meth, crack, um, in there, of course there's going to be a combustible response that could lead to violent behavior. So how do we treat folks with schizophrenia? The drug type is called neuroleptics, and they're also known as antipsychotics, but we prefer the term neuroleptic. And they're used to treat serious mental disorders by changing the levels of neurotransmitters in the brain. The typical neuroleptic reduces the levels of the neurotransmitter dopamine. Thorazine and Haldol are the two most well known. Thorazine was discovered in 1951 and was the first antipsychotic. The problem with typical neuroleptics is there's a lot of side effects, uncomfortable side effects. There is tardive dyskinesia, which is the appearance of slow, involuntary, and uncontrollable rhythmic movements and rapid twitching of the mouth and lips, as well as unusual movement of the limbs. And, you know, these can be so minor that they're barely noticeable versus some people where they, you know, the person looks like they're having a spasm in their mouth. So it can be very noticeable and awkward for the person who's taking the medication. Dry mouth, akathisia, which is an unpleasant inner restlessness. If you think about the last time you couldn't sleep at night and you kept rolling over and, you know, trying to find the cool side of your pillow and pulling the covers down and pulling them back up, it's that you can't get comfortable. Muscle sniff stiffness and cramping tremors and weight gain you know and obviously none of these things sound very fun and you know it's one of the reasons that people oftentimes don't like to stay on their medications because you know with all these side effects it's not a great experience especially you know if if you feel already awkward and weird and you gain a tremendous amount of weight that just exacerbates how awkward and weird you feel Another option is a treatment called atypical neuroleptics, and these are more modern antipsychotic medications. And these include medications known as clozapine, risperdone, risperdal. They lower the levels of dopamine and also reduce the levels of other neurotransmitters, especially serotonin. And here are some of the names of uh, atypical antipsychotics that are used in a clinical setting. So the side effects, and again this is a second de generation uh, medication, uh, very low rate of tardive dyskinesia which is a good thing. However, it can cause an increased level of glucose or blood sugar which is known as hyperglycemia. It can bring on or worsen diabetes and again, there's an excessive weight gain. So, you know, there's bad side effects with atypical and typical neuroleptics. With the typical or first generation antipsychotics, there's a lot of the neurological side effects, the tremors, the muscle cramping, the problems with dry mouth and that unpleasant inner restlessness. With the second generation or the atypical neuroleptics, there's a higher risk of the metabolic side effects. So there's a lot of these problems that haven't been solved yet. And again, these are the reasons why people will oftentimes stop taking their medications because of the side effects. So what is recovery? The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration in 2011 identified four essential dimensions of recovery. Overcoming or managing one's disease. This is a chronic condition 
you will never be cured. Having a stable and safe place to live. Having meaningful daily activities that give life purpose together with the necessary independence, income, and resources. If a person can stay on their meds, can work with a community, and has good family support, they can be a functioning member of society. Social relationships that provide support, friendship, love, and hope. So let's talk about the chance of recovery. With type 1 schizophrenia, these are the people with the positive symptoms such as hallucinations and delusions. They have a distortion of normal function, but they do not have any intellectual impairment, meaning there's no developmental delays, they have an average IQ, they could function in a society if they did not have schizophrenia, and they react well to medication. They have a very good chance of recovery and being able to function in society. Then there's type 2 schizophrenia. And this includes having the negative symptoms such as the flat affect or dulled emotions. They have little inclination to speak and this is a loss of normal functions. They have intellectual impairment and they have a very poor reaction to medication. This means that they have a very poor chance for recovery. So again, some of these, some of these um, negative symptoms are the disorders of thought, attention, they have motor disorder issues, and emotional disorders. So, you know, a type 2 schizophrenic is a much harder case because even if they didn't have schizophrenia, they generally wouldn't be able to live or function without serious psychosocial support in their world. So how do we improve the chances of recovery? Seven dimensions of care will likely have a positive effect on how well patients with schizophrenia do following hospital care. There's a linkage of inpatient care to external services. Medication education, medication management, illness education, family involvement, substance abuse treatment, and psychosocial rehabilitation. So it's not a one and done kind of scenario. There is a collection of remedial and pro-social activities that must take place for the patient, his or her family, and the behavioral health specialists to engage in in order to truly, you know, be proactive for the patient. So what are some of the long-term clinical care challenges? While aggressive care is often required to prevent a schizophrenic client from regressing, many communities do not have either the resources or the med medical personnel to staff these facilities. Often, for-profit institutions will provide substandard care in order to maintain their profit ratios. You know, we're talking about a situation where if your company is for-profit and it needs to make a 20% profit every year, which means that you can't have five nurses, you can only have three, that means there are significantly less opportunities for the patients to have health interventions that will ultimately improve their condition. These institutions end up worsening the client's symptoms and undermining whatever coping skills they may have. So, you know, this is a health policy issue. And until, you know, people speak out and discuss this with their congressional representatives, not much is going to happen. Keep in mind, there's 9 to 10 million people in this country living with this issue over the course of our lifetime. 3 million any given year, 2 to 3 million on any given year are schizophrenic. So we have to begin to understand that the homeless people who are homeless they just don't enjoy sleeping on a steam grate. They have nowhere else to go. And prisons and the facilities 
that are um, set up for other reasons can't house these folks. So we have to look at how do we improve social care for people with schizophrenia who don't have family support that can manage them. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me via email or text. I hope you have a terrific day and uh, I'll talk to you next time.